Okay, so last time we were here, we were talking about avoiding mistakes. So we're talking about from the perspective of the bidder. And the number one is don't ignore market values. If the market says a company is only worth $10 million, what are the chances it's actually worth 15? It's, yeah, the chances that the standalone company is worth more than the current market value are really low. And you'd have to ask yourself, what kind of crazy inside information do I have to have in order to know this thing is more value than the current market value? And if you do have that sort of crazy inside information, how legal would it be for me to buy that company based on that information? The answer is, it would not be. So that's number one. Number two, estimate only incremental cash flows. You'll hear people say, well, we bought this company and our earnings per share went up. Well, no crap. As long as they have positive net income, that's going to happen as long as you don't issue new shares to do it. The question is, has there been any synergy between putting these together? What, is, what are the incremental cash flows over and above just summing the cash flows of the two firms together? Those are your rationales for mergers. And in fact, it's exactly like we said with our capital budgeting uh, NPV analysis. We only look at incremental cash flows. What will change as a result of putting these two companies together? And then third, use the correct discount rate. So here I am, I'm a big, in fact, I will tell you a true story about this. When I worked at Halliburton, our uh, cost of capital at the time of this merger was 11.9%. And we did all sorts of things, but we were a safe old line company compared to this Scottish company that we were looking at. And here's what you need to know to understand what this Scottish company did. Every oil well on the earth produces three things. You just thought it was oil. They all produce um, oil, natural gas, and salt water. Oil, we like. Natural gas, we like if we can pipe it to somewhere. What do you think about the salt water? Do you think anybody wants to buy dirty salt water off of us? No. And so what you'd like to do is to minimize the production of the salt water while maximizing the production of the oil and the natural gas. Well, the Scottish company had developed this valve that sat down at the very bottom of the well and it would, um, it could change to, oh, he's back and late. You could change it to maximize production of oil and gas and minimize production of salt water. But it ran on a constant stream of data, so there had to be a wire that went all the way up. We're talking like 12,000 feet under the surface of the earth. It had to have a wire go up, and it would go to a little satellite dish on the top of the wellhead that would go beep, 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 and ping a satellite, and then go beep, 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 and ping a satellite, or a, an, an office in Houston where you had nerds that would examine the data, and then they would beep, 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 send feedback beep, 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 to the well, and then it would manipulate. It wasn't automatic, so they had trained geologists doing all this. Now, here's the question. Do you think that that was as risky as our normal business, riskier than our normal business, or safer than our normal business? I'll give you a hint. Most of the stuff that I made it was very 19th century technology. We had seals, we had springs, but we're here we're talking about satellites and crap like that, right? And so uh, I was talking to these guys, these Scotsmen, when we were trying to integrate them into Halliburton, and I said, by the way, what uh, discount rate do you guys when you're doing your capital budgeting? And he's like, oh, 25%. And I said, wow, 25%. He says, yeah, this is, this is some risky shit, <laughs> right? That's my terrible Scottish accent. He was telling me that what they were doing was very risky, so they had to have a higher uh, rate of return for it. Now, the question is this, which discount rate should Halliburton have used to analyze this merger? Should they have used the 11.9% of, the, of the safe old line company, or should they have used the risky 25% uh, of the of the risky new technology company. Yeah, they should have used the 25%, right? You know what they did? They used the 11.9%. Now, it's possible it would still have been a positive NPV project if we had analyzed it at 25%. I didn't have all the cash flows um, 
But I'm telling you that if you are going after a target, always use their discount rate. Always use their discount rate, not your own. Okay, number four, be aware of transactions cost. Remember we said that we're gonna have to go out and probably raise money to do this. We may uh, issue debt to buy this company. We may issue shares to get this company. Either way, we're gonna have to have um, investment bankers involved. And remember, anytime we get investment bankers involved, we have flotation costs. And we said flotation costs are important to understand and include in your capital budgeting project, and it's exactly the same here. You could have a merger that looked fine before the fees, that did not look good after the fees. And there's more than just the investment bankers. There are, of course, lawyers, because you're trying to knit two organizations together. You're not gonna do that without lawyers. And then there's disclosure requirements. And you may not even think about this as a dollar cost, but what if in the course of this merger, I had to disclose private competent, confidential competitive information? I had to put it out there for everyone to see in order to be able to get government approval for this merger. Who might be interested in looking at that sort of data? Your competitors, right? Would you want them to have that information? Absolutely not. It would be an advantage for them. And so you always have to think about these sorts of things. That's an additional cost. We can't necessarily put a dollar number on it, but it's a, it's a direct cost of having to disclose that information. Now, uh, one of the things, one of the common mistakes, and I mentioned this earlier about when Halliburton bought Dresser, that we make the assumption that the target managers are stupid and they're doing, bad, uh, doing wrong things because they are irrational or something like that. And oftentimes we find that's not true. Once we get inside the target and we look around, we're like, oh, that's why they were doing that. And so replacing inefficient managers can be a good rationale, but typically we don't A, know the quality of the managers in the target, and B, we overestimate our own talents, as you might have read in the hubris hypothesis. Questions? Okay. Now let's talk about, oh, we've already done that. Boom, 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 boom. Boom. Let's talk about defensive actions. We, we said earlier that target managers were likely to resist um, being a, a merger. And we, we talked about why. But it's possible that managers would do that with, the sharehold, with their own shareholders in mind. By the way, keep in mind, the goal of financial management is to what? Maximize shareholder wealth. And the target managers are responsible for their shareholders, not the better shareholders, their shareholders. And so what they might do is use these defensive measures to get a higher bid out of the bidding firm. Would that be better for their shareholders? Yeah, as a target shareholder, wouldn't you like more money? Oh yeah. And so they might actually be acting uh, in accordance with the goal of financial management, but that's only the case if the deal actually goes through. I mentioned Microsoft trying to buy Yahoo. Um, they just kept de uh, resisting until finally Microsoft went away and Yahoo's share price dropped back to where it was before and perhaps even a little lower because now everybody knew nobody's gonna be able to take over Yahoo. And so in that case, they were not maximizing shareholder wealth, but it's possible that they can. Now let's talk about some of the different ways that people use to defend against takeovers. Uh, the first would be the corporate charter. The corporate charter is really basically the rules of the road for how we make decisions at the company. And so one of the things you can put in there is the supermajority to uh, approve mergers. Remember we said earlier it's often two -third equal to, greater than or equal to two-thirds. Sometimes it's greater than or equal to three-quarters. Those are called supermajorities. They are greater than 50% plus one. 50% plus one is what we would refer to as a simple majority. 
and then there are classified boards. And this is where we uh, stagger the elections of the directors. And so you might think of a, uh, a non-classified board or a straight board as being like the United States House of Representatives. Uh, there are, what, 435 people in the House of Representatives. How many of those get reelected or get run for office every, every two years? Every single, every single one of them in the House of Representatives does. Well, let's talk about the United States Senate. By the way, and that means the term for them is two years, right? Let's talk about the United States Senate. How uh, long is their term? Six years. I, I always think it's funny when the international students get the American questions right. Right. <laughs> Back to the story. So uh, senators are there for six years, and how often do we have, see senators running for election? Every, every two years we do, and here's why. Because 33 are up for election this time, two years later, 33 are up for election, and then 34 are up for election, and that's the cycle over and over and over again. So if you wanted to take over the entire House of Representatives, you could do it in two years. How long would it take you to take over the entire United States Senate? Two years. It's going to take, no, it's going to take six years because we only get to vote on one third of them each time. Does that make sense? Okay. The United States Senate is just like a classified board of directors. So let's talk about uh, if you've got a 12 member board and we have annual board member elections. Then basically we have, say, two board members of every year, and it would take six years to totally clean out that board and put your own people on there. It would take four years for you to get a majority on the board. And so this classified board is a way to keep people from being able to just replace the entire board of directors all in one fell swoop. In theory, it makes it harder to take over the firm. Questions? Okay. Now let's talk about repurchase. Oh, one more thing about um, classified boards. You remember the formula for how many shares you need to, uh, to get a seat on the board of directors? It was, let's see, as there was an N plus one, right? So if, uh, if I am only having two up for election, then I've got to multiply by, my, let's say it's 100 shares. And so we're looking at uh, 30, so it's got to be plus one here. It's 34 shares. What if all 12 stood for election at the same time? See, what's one thirteenth of a hundred? I think seven plus something. So basically, you're going to have to end up with uh, eight or nine shares here. So you can do the math and figure it out. But my point to you is this the more directors standing for election, the easier it is to get someone on the board. Does that make sense? And so these classified boards also have the effect of limiting minority shareholder representation. And when I say minority shareholder, I mean people who own less than 50%. And so this has the uh, impact of limiting minority shareholder representation on the board, which is another thing managers would like to do, because if you get one member on the board that can change the minds of the other people, you might still be out of a job. Okay. Now, let's talk about repurchase and standstill agreements. And these things have to go together. So a standstill agreement is where the bidder agrees to limit its holdings and the target. And it usually marks the end of the attempt. Now, you say, why in the world would the bidder just stop? And the answer is, you've got to give the bidder something in return. And that's where the targeted repurchase comes in. We know that shares, uh, companies can repurchase their shares. But what if the company just tells the bidder, 
I will repurchase your shares at this premium to whatever you paid in uh, exchange for a promise that you'll go away and leave us alone for 10 years. By the way, if they say go away and leave us for 10 years, do you know how old the CEO is? 55, right? Because the CEO is just really protecting themselves until they can retire. Does that make sense? So if I were going to do one of these right now, it would be 13 years, right? Okay, so um, th these two things go together. Now, there is another name for this targeted repurchase. It's called green mail. Now, green mail, there is two, two parts here. Number one, green, is typically referred to as the color of United States currency. It used to be even more green than it is now, but if you look at one side of it, it's more green than anything else, and that's why we call this green mail. And the second thing is um, that we're trying to make it sound like blackmail. Do you guys know what blackmail is? What's blackmail? I was hoping you didn't pick on me. <laughs> oh, let me pick on someone else. What's blackmail? Uh, it's when someone tries to use something against you okay. to make you do something. Yeah, very good. It's when someone has something on you and they're going to try to get you to do something. Usually it's pay money, but it may be other things. Okay, now let's talk about blackmail. And this is just a, a life thing for you. Um, let's say someone has pictures of you in a compromising position with an exotic animal. You know, let's say you were hanging out with Joe at the Tiger Ranch or whatever, and they've got pictures of you. Now, they say, if you don't release, if you don't give me so much money, I will release this picture. Now, the question is, do you pay? No. No, why not? Oh, it's illegal. Okay. No, I mean, you can, um, you can turn it around, and if they do, you can sue them. Oh, yeah, okay, I like that. Uh, or you can report them and get them arrested and thrown in jail, right? Okay, but when you do that, what's going to happen? Yeah, it's going to come out, right? And so, uh, there's, so there's the first way that we put an end to blackmail is by saying, okay, yeah, I was at the Tiger Ranch. Look, here I am with this uh, leopard cub in my lap. It was a bad move, right? But uh, I, I confess to it. What's that? Turn it into a Kardashian. Yeah, so where you actually use it to build your fame or infamy. Exactly. Yeah, or uh, so one example of this was David Letterman. David Letterman was a night, uh, nighttime TV host, and he was caught having sex with his secretary on his desk. But per, oh yeah, and the person that caught them uh, was blackmailing him, and he's like, you know what? And he uh, he came out on the show, and he said. This is what's going on. This is what this guy's trying to do. He says, the person I feel the worst for in this is my wife. Number two, I feel bad for the secretary because now everyone knows she had the poor taste to have sex with me, right? And so he turned it into a joke. So it really didn't hurt him. He didn't lose his job over it. I think his wife stuck around. Um, but the other, what's the only other way to, to put an end to blackmail? Because what, let's assume that you pay him. What are they going to do? Continue to do it. What's that? Yeah, they're going to keep coming back, right? They're going to keep coming back as long as they've got that picture of you with a leopard cup, right? They're going to keep coming back. Now, uh, what's the only other way to put an end to blackmail? Release it yourself. What's that? Release it yourself. No, I already mentioned that. That's number one. What's the other way? Come on, look deep into your dark, dark heart. Kill them. Kill them, <laughs> right? Kill them. Now, most of you have probably not killed someone before. Um, and so you, I say most, and so what you probably do would be to try to hire someone to do the job for you. Less mess, less fuss. Now, here's the problem. Every time that I hear about this, uh, the, the uh, proposed assassin is almost always an undercover sheriff's deputy. Almost always. So what do I tell you out of these two choices? Which one's really going to work out better for you? Just tell the truth, right? The truth shall set you free. So, there is your life tip for the day. If someone's trying to blackmail you, just get it over with. Rip the Band-Aid off. Okay, back to, by the end, don't kill anyone. Back to the story. Um, green mail. Let's give you an example of how this, this happened. If you go back to, I believe this is the 1990s, um, the American company Goodyear. Do you guys know what Goodyear makes? What, a good, what does Goodyear make? Uh, 
Tires. Tires. That's what they're known for. And Goodyear was basically nothing but a tire company right up until World War II-ish time frame. And the government said, hey, you know, we need people to manufacture. And the thing that I remember is the F4U Corsair fighter uh, for the Marine Corps and the Navy. And if, if you guys would do that, that would be great. And so they convert one of their blimp hangers in Akron, Ohio, into an assembly line, and they start building these Corsairs. Well, of course, the war comes to an end. And at that point, Goodyear should have said, okay, we're out of the aviation business. It really isn't us. But instead, what they do, because managers love empires and diversification, they, they keep with it and they double down. And they develop Goodyear Aerospace. And at one point, Goodyear was actually putting satellites into orbit, strangely. Now, over the years, they went ahead and they did more empire building. And they bought an athletic footwear company. Can you understand? Well, can you tell me what the rationale might be for a tire company to buy an athletic footwear company? Use the yeah, they, it's it's like shoes are like tires for your feet, right? Mm -hmm. Now, uh, there. So we know that tires are black and round. Not a lot of fashion sense involved in tires. You think there might be though with athletic footwear? Yeah, little outside. I gotta make this thing silent. Okay, there we go. A um, little outside of their expertise. And they kept doing this. They were buying all these. They were doing a conglomerate uh, strategy where they were just buying all sorts of crap. By the early 1990s, Goodyear is wasting tons of money and uh, not giving a lot of shareholder value. And so there was this uh, an Englishman, and his name was Goldstein, Goldsmith, Gold something or other. Let's call him Goldfinger, you know, like the Bond villain. Let's call him Goldfinger. Anyway, so Goldfinger had a, a, a message in with Goldman Sachs. He says, guys, if you see a company that is being poorly managed that I could break apart and make money from selling the pieces, let me know. And this is a, how you make money off conglomerates, is you buy them, you break them apart, and you sell the pieces because the pieces together are most of the time worth more than if they are all together. So the pieces in and of themselves, summed up, are worth more. So it's the opposite of synergy, right? Okay, so uh, Goldman Sachs gives him a call, and they're like, hey, we think we found someone for you. He says, who? And they say, Goodyear. And so uh, Goldfinger looks into Goodyear, and he says, you know, that's, that's a great idea. And so they set up a bunch of LLCs and whatnot, and they start buying up Goodyear stock. And they buy Goodyear stock up until they get 4.999% remember about 4.999% because as soon as they go over that, he's got to announce his intentions. And so then he makes one big last push, goes over 4.999%, files with the SEC and says that his intention is to take over the firm. Do you think he has the attention of Goodyear's management? Absolutely. And they're like, <gasps> and here is what happens next. Of course, the CEO gets up and says that uh, this guy is, his offer is totally undervaluing the company and that we will be better off together than apart. And they make all the usual platitudes, all of which, by the way, are total crap. Okay. Now, at the same time, they are also appealing. By the way, uh, Goodyear is a, Akron is a Goodyear company town. Akron, Ohio, very, very much Goodyear. And so they appeal to the good people of Akron, buy as much Goodyear stock as you can to keep our company, our company, out of the hands of this evil limey. By the way, limey is a derogatory term for a British person. Keep our, our, our Goodyear, our company, out of the hands of this evil limey. And so they actually had kids that were giving up their milk money by the way, used to, and you'd take a nickel or a dime and they'd give you a carton of milk, right? Uh, they were giving up their milk money, kids were giving up their allowance, people were giving up Social Security to try to buy Goodyear stock to keep Goodyear in Akron. Now, what do you think the managers were doing at exactly the same time? Yeah, they're selling their stock! Why? Man, this is the most the shares have been worth in years, right? Because people are expecting to get taken over. Isn't that sick? Okay, remember, people are scumbags. Okay, so 
Uh, but it looks like the evil Limey is going to win. And so Goodyear, by the way, he lives in London, Goodyear sends an invitation. Goldfinger, we would love to meet with you and talk about your plans for our company. And we'll send the private jet to London to pick you up and bring you back to Akron. And we, you can see the company, you can meet the people, and then we'll talk plans. And so he shows up, and at the end of it, they get him into a conference room, and they say, okay, here's the deal, pal. You bought all of your shares for between $10 and $15 a share. We will give you $20 a share if you promise in return to leave us alone for 10 years. What do you think Goldfinger did? He took the money, right? I mean, do you really want to take over this stinking heap of garbage and try to make something out of it? Or is it easier just to take the $20 and go off and look for your next target? Yeah, so he took the $20 a share. Now, so far, everything sounds good. Goodyear is saved. The people of Akron rejoice. Uh, the managers got rich by selling their shares. It's all good, right? Except for one thing. Where did the money come from to pay Goldfinger? Who took it on the nose? By the way, the money that they used to pay him <coughs> off, did it come out of the manager's pockets? No. Whose money was it? Shareholders. The shareholder's money. Now, uh, Goldfinger's a shareholder. He's perfectly fine with this whole deal. Who shouldn't be fine with this whole deal? The other shareholders of Goodyear. The other shareholders of Goodyear should be livid. At the least, they should demand to also be able to get $20 for their shares if they should so choose to sell, right? So, in the end, were they maximizing the goal of finance, or were they, were they doing the goal of financial management? No, they weren't maximizing the shareholders' wealth. In fact, they were destroying shareholder wealth by patting this guy's pockets in order to get him to go away. Does that make sense? Okay. <clears throat> now let's talk about poison pills. It's basically a financial device that's designed to uh, make it basically financial suicide for the other party to take over the firm. So uh, here's what I could do. I could threaten that if they uh, make this takeover attempt, what I'm going to do is go out and borrow a lot of short-term debt and then pay a huge dividend to my current shareholders. Would that make the company attractive or unattractive to take over? Yeah, make it unattractive, right? Because you're going to take this thing over and you're going to immediately have to pay a lot of the short-term debt. And so it would be financial suicide for you to go ahead and try to take over the firm if they were threatening to do this. Now, as a target shareholder, I'd be perfectly fine with that because I'm getting a boatload of money, hopefully, right? Except for it is keeping me from getting the merger premium. Okay, let me see what else I need to tell you about that. Oh, let's think about what's more, what makes you more attractive target. Do you think having a lot of cash or a lot of debt makes you a more attractive target? Cash. And folks, it's exactly the same when you're picking a spouse, right? Would you rather marry someone with a lot of cash or with a lot of debt? Yeah. A lot of cash, right? Does that make sense? Do you think humans actually take this into account? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So I've got this friend who's newly divorced, and uh, she said she wants three things out of a man. She wants a background check. She wants a credit report. She wants those tests that you guys do down at the Greene County Health Department, right, to make sure he's not, you know, yeah. carrying something. Anyway, it makes a lot of sense, right? And so what I would tell you is if you are find yourself in this situation where uh, someone has talked about marriage, you say, great, let's each get our credit report pulled, and we will we'll both share, right? That's only fair. Okay. So, it's the same way, though, with companies. If you're sitting around on a boatload of cash, it makes you very attractive as a takeover target. 
And so one of the things you could do is just pay out most of the cash as a dividend, right? Because that takes it off the books and gets it out of the way, makes you less attractive. And if they were still sniffing around, then you could do this thing we're talking about like a bunch of debt right, that you could take on that would make you unpalatable. But let's say that the company does take on the short-term debt, pay out the huge dividend. Now they are heavily indebted, they're cash strapped, assume that the bidder goes away. What does that do to the financial condition of the target? Would you like to be heavily indebted with a lot of money that you owed in a very short term? No. no. It basically, it destroys the target firm if they carry through with this. So it's basically mutual assured destruction. And it reminds me of these people say, well, if I can't have her, no one can. And then they go out and, and do something bad to their girlfriend. I don't know if you guys have heard that, but it's, it's kind of that same mindset. Okay. Now we also have the share rights plan. And this is where I offer the old shareholders, let's call them people who have shares, who've owned shares for more than a year. What I'm gonna do is I'm going to tell all of them that they can all buy one additional share for every share they own at half price. Wouldn't that be great to be able to buy an additional share at half price? And so what happens is basically if you don't buy those shares, you're going to get diluted. But let's say that the, uh, the bidder has 5% in the firm. And then we go out and we issue, we sell additional shares to the other 95%. Now you've gone from having 5% as the bidder, now you're down to around 2.5%. You thought you were getting close, but you're nowhere near close. Does that make sense? And so that's why the share rights plan can be used to uh, protect against a takeover. Now, if the target managers are living out the goal of financial management, basically this is just a technique designed to get the uh, bidder to the table to negotiate. So we can negotiate a better deal for the target shareholders. Now what else do you think that they negotiate while the uh, bidder is there? People are Scumbags, do you think they might negotiate a nice hefty payout for themselves to walk away? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if, if I were in that situation, I would certainly try that. So you would be a scumbag? Exactly. Well, I don't know if, you, if I made this clear or not. Um, all humans are scumbags. I'm a human. By transitivity, that means I'm a scumbag. Just ask my wife. Okay. Questions? Now, once the uh, bidder has agreed to the terms, then the target rescinds these threats, and then things move forward. Okay, now let's talk about going private or leveraged buyouts. Um, we talked earlier about the leveraged buyout, and we said basically people are borrowing a bunch of money and using it to take the firm private. Now, something you need to know is that a firm can only be taken over if its shares are publicly traded. And so what if I go out and buy up all the publicly traded shares? Then basically I am defending against a takeover. I am keeping people from being able to, to take over the firm. However, from the existing shareholders perspective, this is a takeover because they're, they're selling their shares at a premium. Does that make sense? It's, it's a it's a takeover from the target, uh, target shareholder's perspective, uh, from the bidder's perspective, who's probably the CEO and his close friends. It is a defensive measure that keeps other people from being able to take over the firm. Now, sometimes the fun thing is we see people attempting one of these, and then as a result, we know the company is in play, and then other people uh, jump in and outbid the manager group and so they end up being out of work entirely and that's exactly what happens in the movie Barbarians at the Gate if you watch that one. By the way let's talk about this whole idea of being in play and I'll give you an example uh, starting 
uh, with something you probably will recognize. Did they have dances when you guys were in like junior high, high school? Mm -hmm. Okay. So at the dance, this is the way it worked back in the 80s. Uh, there were two groups of people, uh, they were called boys and girls, and uh, when you got to the dance, all the girls were lined up on this wall, and all the boys were lined up on this wall. And all the boys, who at that time were the ones who were required to initiate such actions, were too scared to ask the girls to dance, right? And so this was the status quo. Now, what it takes is someone who has nothing to lose to break the status quo. And that was me, right? I got nothing to lose. So I go over and I ask, by the way, who do I ask? You think I asked the most unattractive girl? Mm -hmm. No, I asked the prettiest girl, right? You know she wants to dance, I can see her foot moving, right? <laughs> ask the prettiest girl if she'll dance. Now, I can't dance for anything, but she's like, yes, and we go out and we dance. Now, what do you think happens at the very next song? Yet there's like a line to talk to this girl about wanting to dance, right? Because now we know she is in play, right? That she's willing, you know, hey, if she'll dance with Haggard, she'll dance with me, right? <laughs> Does that make sense? Okay, so we see the same thing with companies. And the example I'll give you is Cadbury. Cadbury was an old English chocolate house, and they make those delicious little Cadbury eggs that you have at Easter time. Oh, I love those things. Um, if they sold them year-round, I'd probably weigh 11 pounds more. Back to the story. Um, Cadbury had, was always thought of as a, store, uh, as, a, as a company that's not for sale. And then uh, Kraft comes along and makes an offer for Cadbury. And Cadbury does not say no. In fact, they start to negotiate. So what do you think happened next? Well, next, uh, Ferrero Rocher. Do you guys know who they are? Snooty Italian chocolate company. They jump into the fray. They're like, hey, we might be interested in Cadbury too. And then a message comes in from Hershey, Pennsylvania. The trust, the charitable trust that owns Hershey starts also talking about jumping in. Now, what do you think happens to the share price at Cadbury every time one of these new people pops on the scene? Oh, yeah, boom, 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 right? Now, that story ends, and, and the reason these other people jump in is because they hear Cadbury's in play, right? It's like after the girl dances with me, everybody knows that she'll dance with uh, an unattractive person that, with two left feet. And so if this person, if, this, if Cadbury's willing to talk to Kraft, then certainly they'd be willing to talk to Ferrero Rocher or Hershey's, who are much better known for their candy acumen. Okay. Now, the reason I tell you that is because what does that do? Assume that Kraft eventually takes over the firm. Uh, what does that do to its cost to acquire um, Cadbury? Yeah, it's much higher, right? And so the NPV of that project is actually much lower. In fact, Kraft went out and sold its frozen pizza business to be able to do that deal. I don't know about you, but I think maybe they've been better off sticking with the frozen pizzas because it's something that they knew, as opposed to the only thing, the only other candy that Kraft does that I know about would be those little caramel cubes that you see around Halloween. That's it, right? Okay. Now let's talk about divestitures and restructuring. A divestiture is when a firm sells assets, operations, or revisions to a third party. Remember, I told you that Come and Go was selling out to a company called Maverick. And Maverick and Come and Go's uh, areas overlap. And in that overlap, they're going to have assets that basically the federal government is going to force them to sell to someone else. And when they do that, that will be a divestiture. Another example, when I worked with Halliburton, we took over Dresser, but there were certain parts of the company that we wanted nothing to do with. For instance, Ingersoll Rand pumps, great pumps, we didn't want anything to do with them. Um, Waukesha compressors, great compressors, but they didn't fit into our business. And so what we did then was sell those extra assets we didn't want to um, private equity. Now, 
It does two things. Number one, it gets rid of assets we don't want. And number two, we probably took on some debt to make the deal. What can we do with the money we receive from the sale of the assets? Yeah, we've got to pay down that debt. And in fact, if you look at Goodyear, Goodyear took on some debt to make that repurchase. And then how did they pay the debt back? They did exactly what they should have done all along, which was to sell off the aerospace division, to sell off the footwear division. They sold off all those things that were dragging them down. And so in the end, was it still good for uh, Goodyear shareholders? It, it, it was in the sense that they got back to tires, which is what they're good at. Okay. Okay, we talked about antitrust problems, we talked about raising cash to pay for the deal, and we talked about getting rid of unwanted assets. So I think we've covered all of this information. Any questions? Now let's talk about the divestiture types. Um, the equity carve-out is where the parent puts the undesirable assets into a completely separate company, which is completely owned by the parent. And then they're going to sell a fraction to the public in an IPO. And so instead of selling them to private equity, what Halliburton could have done was put all those unwanted assets and then done an IPO just for that little piece of the firm. Now, why would you do that? Do we truly know what those unwanted assets are worth? Do we know the fair market value of the unwanted assets? No, we, we really don't, right? Who's going to decide the fair market value of the assets? The market. So how can we test the waters? Well, we can IPO uh, a small percentage of the shares in this piece, and then that's going to tell us what the other 95%, let's say, is worth. And now we know how much to ask for it. Does that make sense? We know the market value. And then we also, we can have a spin-off. A spin-off is where we are going to issue shares in this new firm on a pro rata basis and just give them to the current shareholders. And uh, I, I recall a, a spin-off like this, uh, I think it was Procter & Gamble owned Jif Peanut Butter and some other stuff. And they decided they didn't want to be in that, that business anymore and so they did a spin-out. My dissertation advisor at the time owned Procter & Gamble shares, and so say he owned 1% of Procter & Gamble, after this uh, spin-out, he would have 1% of this new Jif peanut butter company. Does that make sense? And he, it, he did not want to own the peanut butter company, so he, had, uh, he could have sold the shares, but fortunately for him, Smuckers, the jelly people, come along and make an offer for... Jeff. Now, it would be my guess that Procter & Gamble plus Jeff summed together was worth more than Procter & Gamble was before it spun out Jeff. That's the only reason you do something like that is to maximize shareholder wealth. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, why would Smuckers think it would be good to own Jeff when Procter & Gamble would not? Peanut butter and jelly. If you're an American, you know this is a delicious thing. If you're not from America, you probably think it's disgusting. But, yeah. <laughs> you're just not giving it a chance, right? Okay. So, um, in fact, when we're in China, that's pretty much what we live on is peanut butter and jelly. Okay, back to the story. Um, it's, uh, it's, it was a spinoff that made that possible. And then we have the split up. So we've had these antitrust laws since the early 20th century. And antitrust is where you're basically saying you've got too big of a market share, so we're going to have to do something about it. And the last big example of this was AT&T. AT&T basically owned the entire phone system here in the U.S. There were a few regional players, but basically if you wanted to do business on a telephone, you had to do it through AT&T. And they had AT&T was the head company, and then the, the subsidiaries were Southwestern Bell, uh, Pacific Bell, and all these companies that had Bell under, or next to their name. And the government said, wait a minute, you guys, this is 1980s, said, wait a minute, you guys, you've got too much market power, 
you're charging too high a price. And here's what AT&T said. It's like, no, that can't possibly be so. The only reason that you've allowed us to have this monopoly is because you regulate it. You set our rates. And the government says, we're not buying it. And so they went to court and they forced AT&T to split itself into uh, the, the top part, which was just AT&T, that was going to be uh, the owner of the long distance lines, which they then forced to lease out uh, space on those lines to other companies. So there would no longer be a long distance monopoly. And then they spun off each of these regional phone companies, which were called the Baby Bells. They spun those off to also uh, be independent companies. And so now we've basically broken up this monopoly. And I'll give you an example of what happened after that. So uh, it was my birthday in fifth grade. I got a brand new saxophone uh, from my mom. And so I said, oh, hey, I want to call my buddy Brent. And my mom says, well, she says, it's going to cost 10 cents a minute for you to call Brent. And you need to know two things. 10 cents was more money than, than it is now. And the second is my mom is notoriously cheap. OK, so I said, OK, well, I'll keep it short. And so I call, and 30 cents later, I've told Brent about the new saxophone, and he's like, yay. Anyway, if you roll for, and that was prior to 1984, which is when all this happened. Now, think about how much it costs you to call, uh, so call from Springfield to Mount Vernon now. How much would it cost you to do that? Free. Yeah, in, in essence, free, no incremental costs. And in fact, uh, in the end of the course, we've got cell phones, and that makes the things a lot different. But even back then, it went from being 10 cents a minute to being two to three cents a minute. And so it really did make a big difference. And so this is what happens when the government goes after a monopoly. Who are they going after now? Do you know? What's the talk about? Amazon? Facebook? Google. Amazon, Facebook, Google, if, uh, if certain people in the government get their way, they're going to be undergoing a split up too. What would a split up look like at YouTube? All right, so at Google. Well, I think that YouTube would get split off, and I think that Gmail would get split. I mean, there's all sorts of different ways that could be split up. And what about Facebook? Facebook has um, Instagram, and they've got WhatsApp. And so there's a chance that they would get busted up along those lines as well. Does that make sense? OK. So that's the split up. That is the end of the chapter 21 slides. Was that a yay? I know. It's a long chapter. And it's just so rich with examples of scumbaggery. OK, now, here's what I want you to know. Uh, here's what I want to do. I want to go ahead and skip over talking about the hubris hypothesis. And in return, I won't put it on the exam. Do we have a deal? Yay! Okay. You're welcome. Okay. So now let's move on to options and corporate finance. <clears throat> this is chapter 17. So an option gives the holder the right, but not the obligation, to do something at or, so let's just make it general. The right, or, or the right but not the obligation, to do something at or before a, a given date. Um, when you guys were accepted into Missouri State University, that was an option. You had the right but not the obligation to come here. You could have gone somewhere else. Does that make sense? And they probably gave you some sort of date that you had to let them know by. At the very least, you had to let them know before you showed up on campus, right? And so that fits our definition of an option. And what about when someone asks you to marry them? That's an option. You have the right, but not the obligation to marry them. And they might or might not put a date on it. You need to let me know in the next week, or I'm going to move on to the next person, right? OK, so that's, that's options. And what we see this in finance is about the right, but not the obligation, to buy or sell a given quantity 
of an asset on or before a given date, and we'll talk about the difference between on or before, at a set price. And so we have to have uh, what is the asset, how much of the asset, when is this date, and uh, what is this price that we're going to do business with, assuming that the option holder exercises the option. There's a word for you. Exercise the option. If you actually marry the person, you are exercising the option the proposal gave to you. If you actually came to Missouri State, you guys all exercise the option to come here. Okay, so act, in this case, exercising the option is the act of buying or selling the underlying asset. And the person that exercises the option is the holder of the option. Two groups of people here. The holder and the writer. Holders and writers. The holders are the ones that have the option. The writer of the option has to do whatever the holder wants to do. Okay, we also refer to the holder of the option as the buyer of the option. The holder of the option is also known as the buyer of the option. They are the ones that have the option. We also refer to the writer of an option as being the seller of the option. The writer, seller, same person. They don't have the right to say no. When the holder or uh, buyer says, I want to buy that asset, and it's that kind of option, then the writer or seller has to sell the asset. By the way, we call options and other things like them, like futures contracts, things like that, we call them all derivatives. And the reason we call them derivatives is because their value is derived from the value of an underlying asset. That underlying asset that we're agreeing to buy or sell, the value of the option is derived directly from the value of that underlying um, asset. And I'll show you how to do that. Now that price that we agree to do business at on a future date, on or before, that's called the strike or exercise price. It's called the strike or exercise price. And uh, our book uses the letter E. But you may also see for strike price, you may see the letter K. Why do you think people would use K for strike price? Baseball, right? In baseball, what's the notation for strike? K, right? So you may see either one of those letters uh, used to denote the strike price. And then we have expiry. I had a guy one time tell me, he says, I think you've got a typo on your slide. I said, oh, please let me know. And he says, expiry isn't a word. And I said, yes, it is. It turns out that's the British. In fact, uh, are you you're from Pakistan? Yeah, we use that. Yeah, they use that. And you get over, you get in Britain, and it says, ex, instead of saying expiration date on the carton, it says expiry. Yeah, we pronounce it as expiry. Ooh, expiry. <laughs> Boy, I'm gonna have to I'm gonna have to work that one into my my vocabulary. Yeah, expiry. and and the daddy daddy would just like you said derivatives, you know? Uh -huh. What do you call them? Also that derivatives. What did I say? Derivatives, like differently. I said derivatives. Yeah, we call it derivatives. Can you guys hear the difference? No. Okay, I can't either. I'm sorry. <laughs> did you understand me when I said it? Yeah, I Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay, well, I appreciate you working with my accent. I really do. By the way, Americans think they don't have an accent. Is that true? Total crap, right? Everybody has an accent. Okay, um, so that's the maturity date of the option. And we're going to see that that is the date that on or before we've got to do this. And it depends on the kind of option, whether it's on or on or before. And we'll get into that. Questions so far? Let's talk about European versus American options. With a European option, the only day it can be exercised is expiry. 
With European options, the only day it can be exercised is at expiry. With American options, you can exercise it up to and including expiry. Now let's talk about this. I'm going to prove to you mathematically later on, maybe today, maybe on Tuesday or Thursday, uh, that you it's never optimal to exercise an option early. It's never optimal to exercise an option early. And I'll prove it to you mathematically, but I want to kind of give you a framework to think about it. You have a job offer, and that job offer says you need to accept it or reject it by June 1st. You look at it, it looks pretty good to you. What do you want to do? What is your desire? You want to do it right now. And here's what I'm going to tell you. Don't do it. And here's why. A lot can happen between now and June 1st. What kinds of things might happen? You might get a better offer, right? And the same can be said of a proposal of marriage. Someone says, <laughs> right? Up until the time that you walk down the aisle, you might get a better offer. Who knows? Okay. Let's see. Um, so, but I'll prove that to you mathematically after a while. So, what's that? That's not true, though. Okay, go ahead. Because when you get closer and closer and closer to expiration date, you don't, you don't, you don't have any, any like, IV left, you know? Like, there's no incentive to exercise it on expiration date and earlier. Earlier the better, though, isn't it? No, I'll prove it to you. Remember, I told you I'd prove it to you. That's true. <laughs> this is why you're here, so I can convince you that you're wrong. <laughs> okay, I'm glad that you're thinking about such things. Most people sit there and go, option, what the hell is that? Okay, so she's talking about intrinsic value and speculative value. But we'll get to that. Okay, um, an option is, oh, and, and I thought you were talking about the marriage thing. And I will point. I didn't say that. Okay, well, I will, I will say this about the marriage option. I had friends that kept extending, right, thinking that they would get a better offer. But here's the problem with viewing marriage through the option framework. What's happening to the other people in the pool as you are waiting? Yeah. So I have this friend, she's 35, and she's like, you know, she thinks it's time to get married. And, and she went out with this guy, and she's like, he's a total... And I won't even repeat what she said. I said, don't worry, there are plenty of fish in the sea. She says, no, at my age, it's not a sea, it's a puddle, right? And it gets even worse the older that you get. And I've had two or three friends that went through this whole thing of getting a PhD and getting tenure, and then they start thinking about marriage, and by that time, all the good ones are taken. So be careful thinking about marriage through an options framework through more, more than just like a couple of months, right? Because the, uh, the good ones might get taken. Okay, now in the money, if um, you exercise the option and it gives you a positive payoff, we say it's in the money. And you very definitely would want to exercise an in the money option if you're holding it at expiry. Uh, if it's earlier than that, we'll talk about what you should do. At the money, means basically it's going to result in a zero payoff. By the way, let's talk about the difference between payoff and profit. Payoff is the money that you will receive from exercising. However, it's not the same as profit because in order to be able to have this option, you have to pay something. It's called a premium. And so we're going to see that the profit it's going to be equal to the payoff minus that premium. And this is to the uh, option holder. Okay. If it's out of the money, exercising it would result in a negative payoff. So I'll give you an example. 
the stock price is currently $18. I have an option that would allow me to buy it at $20. Should I exercise the option and pay? Hell no. Yet you will occasionally see people do just that because they really, really, really want to op exercise an option. And you know, fine, I'll take their money if I'm the guy writing the option. Uh, but you never want to exercise an out of the money option. Now, if you don't exercise the option, the payoff is then zero and your profit is simply, you lose the premium, right? So it's negative of the premium. Questions? Okay, so let's talk about, we're going to talk about two kinds of options. We're going to call the first one a call option. And that gives the buyer the right, but not the obligation. This is the buyer or the holder. The right, but not the obligation to uh, buy the given quantity of a, a number of shares of stock at uh, some time in the future at this given price that we've decided on, this strike price. And so when we say we exercise a call option, we say we are calling in the asset. So if I exercise the call option on these shares, I'm going to call in those shares. Now you could have call options on other things other than stocks. So for example, when I was at Mizzou, one of my derivatives teacher was also on the board of the Catholic school system there in Columbia. And they wanted to build a new high school, but they weren't sure they could get the funding together, but they knew where they wanted to build the school. In order to keep someone else from buying that property in the meantime, they bought a call option on the property. And I think it was just like one year out in the future. And they basically paid the landowner a certain amount of money in order to get, to get them to keep the land off the market for one year and to agree to sell it to them at the strike price at the end of that year if the school district chose to exercise that option. And in the end, they did end up exercising that option. And so you can have call options on more than just stocks. So let's talk about call option pricing at expiry. As she has already pointed out, when you are at the very end of the life of the option, the only value that you have left is the difference between the strike price and the exercise price if this thing's in the money. Now, we've said that a European call option at expiry, that's the only day you can exercise it. It turns out the value of an American option on that day is exactly the same because once you get to expiry, the American and European options are identical. So let's talk about what these different variables we have here. S sub T is the stock price. S sub T is the current stock price. Now, be careful because it says ST and people always want to think, oh, well, that's the strike price. The strike price, we're actually going to be using the letter E E is short for exercise. E stands for exercise, so that's the exercise price. So the value of a call option is the maximum of either the stock price minus the exercise price or zero. Now let's talk about different scenarios here. What if the stock price is higher than the exercise price? then S sub T minus E will be positive. Which will be greater, a positive number or zero? Positive. positive number. So if the strike price, or the stock price, is greater than the exercise price, then we see the value of a call option is merely the strike price minus the exercise price. What if the uh, stock price is less than the exercise price? then S sub T minus E will be negative. What is greater, a negative number or zero? Zero. zero. So if the stock price of a call on a call option is lower than the exercise price, then the call option is worth zero. 
What if stock price is exactly equal to the exercise price? Yeah, it's still zero, right? And so basically we're seeing the only way that this thing has a value greater than zero is if the stock price is greater than the exercise price. And that value is going to be stock price minus exercise price. Questions? Okay, now let's look at call option payoffs. And remember, payoff is not the same as profit. We'll get to profit next time. Here's the payoff. Let's say that the strike price or the exercise price here is 50. For any stock prices below at uh, 50 or below, what's the value of this option at expiry? Zero. But then something cool happens. As we get above the exercise price, for every dollar we go up, the value of the option goes up one dollar. It makes perfect sense because stock price minus exercise price, the exercise price stays the same, and so that means the value of the call option goes up directly with the stock price, one for one, uh, after we hit the exercise price. So what's the theoretical maximum payoff for a call option? Infinity, right? In theory, uh, share prices can go to infinity. And so if share prices can go to infinity, share price minus exercise price, because exercise price stays the same, could go to infinity. So in theory, the payoff for the call option uh, could be Infinity. Have we ever seen an infinity payoff for a call option? No. Okay, any questions so far? So let's talk about, well, and well let's talk about the profits first, and then we'll talk about when should we op exercise this option. Now let's assume that you paid $10 for this option, and so our profit is equal to payoff minus premium. We already know what the payoff is. All we have to do is shift that entire curve that we just looked at, shift it down $10. And so basically our profit is negative $10 all the way up to the exercise price, and then it starts to go up. And then we have a break-even price. The break-even price will always be equal to, for a call option, break-even price for a call, will always be equal to the strike price plus the premium. The break-even price will always be equal to the stock price plus the premium. And so here, what's that? strike the first time and you said stock. Okay, okay, so. Because uh, there are two different things, right? Yeah, I, uh, you're absolutely right. Let me say this one more time and make sure I get it right. That the break-even is the strike price plus the premium. Strike plus premium. Sorry about that. Thank you for calling me out. You're welcome. Okay. Now, once we get above 60, then our profit goes up. Uh, it gets positive and it goes up a dollar for every dollar the stock price goes up. So, let's ask this question. Should you exercise this call option if the stock price is 40 at expiry? No. Should you exercise it if the stock price is 50 at expiry? No. Should you exercise it if it is 80 at expiry? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Should you exercise it if the stock price is 55? Yes, no, maybe. <laughs> okay, you say yes, why? Because the profit is going to be the 55 minus the premium. Okay. And, and you're going to lose less. Exactly! We lose less. Now, we're still having a negative profit, but hey, we're stuck with a negative profit of 10 unless we do something. You always exercise the call option if the stock price is above the strike price. You may end up uh, still losing money, but you'll lose less. Does that make sense? 
So take a look at what happens between 50 and 60. Can you see that the profit's actually going up the whole time? You definitely want to exercise in that zone, even though you're still going to have a negative profit. Yes? So what's, like I don't understand why this line from zero went to like minus 10 is this graph. Oh, okay, because we paid $10 for the option. That first graph is just the payoff. It doesn't consider what we had to pay for that option. The second graph is of profit. And so it's profit is equal to payoff minus the premium. In this case, the premium was $10. That's why the second curve is just shifted down by $10. Does that make sense? Okay. Let's see. Next time, we will talk about put options. If you have any questions, let me know. Send me an email, and I will see you next time.